All right, so I'm out here to introduce the co-founder and CEO of Thumbtack, which is a platform that allows you to hire experienced professionals to accomplish any of your personal projects. They have over a thousand categories, generate over a billion dollars in revenue for independent business owners. And in December of 2015, uh, we're valued at over a billion dollars, making them a unicorn company. Uh, Marco graduated from Columbia University and almost had a degree in neuroscience, which is pretty cool. Uh, we also have on the stage Brian Schreier from Sequoia Capital, who is one of the investors in Thumbtack, as well as Trulia, Qualtrics, and Dropbox. So some big names. Brian also enjoys cooking, backyard farming, uh, and used to run all of the global business for Shell Sandberg when she worked at Google uh, and w was re recommended to Sequoia by her. So some fun facts and let's give it up. Big, warm startup grind. Welcome to Marco Zappacosta and Brian Schreier. All right, we're going to try to confuse you and flip the pictures here. You guys can figure it out, though, I'm sure. Um, hi, everyone. We want to thank Startup Grind for, for having us. We're excited to be here. We actually had a chance to do this, uh, was it kind of mid-last year? Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's been a year now for a smaller group in, in San Francisco. And it was, it was one of the highlights of 2015 for me, just like awesome people, uh, great questions, and really enjoyed meeting the, the companies afterward. Um, and it's, it's funny because... I think of as a grind as, as a really positive thing. You know, at Sequoia, we're always looking th for founders who can grind and who can go through, go through the grind. And, kind of, and, and those, are the, those are the types of people that win uh, and build very large, enduring enterprises. And uh, probably the, the best, you know, the prototypical example of founders who can just get through anything and, and, and make, it, make it big, make it a success are the founders of Thumbtack, Marco and Jonathan. So, uh, I'm psyched that we have this, this lineup today. So thanks for joining me, yeah, Marco. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, why don't we start out with a quick introduction on Thumbtack. Would sure. you mind just level setting the audience, what you guys do, give us a quick status update on how big the company is? Absolutely. Key metrics. So Thumbtack helps you hire the right professional for whatever project you're trying to accomplish, be it a painter, tutor, caterer. And it's very easy to find names and numbers today, right? Google, Yelp, lots of places. The hard part, though, is figuring out which one of these folks is actually available and interested and qualified in doing that job. And that's what Thumbtack does radically better than really anybody on Earth. You come to us, you detail your project, you sort of fill out a questionnaire. We send that out to our network of trusted professionals, and the ones who are available and interested quote directly back to you. And with that, we send reviews, pictures, everything that you need to make a confident hiring decision. So for the first time, you don't have to go hunting. For the professionals, they come to you, and you can quickly and confidently make a hiring decision. Um, this has really resonated on both sides. Uh, we are now facilitating over a billion dollars a year in commerce, and we have more than 200,000 active paying professionals, none of whom were recruited with the sales force. And the reason we were able to do that is because the pros really love the model. They don't pay to sign up. There's no subscription. There's no monthly minimum. They simply pay to respond to the customers that they want to engage. And they love that. And that's what's helped us scale. And you know, we're now 400 people here in the United States and growing strong. Awesome. Thanks. So one of the things that we look for at Sequoia in companies when they come in is obviously the market size. Can you talk a little bit about the market size and the, the, the penetration of the market that sure. your, your billion dollars or so GMV represents? So we've, we've had some struggles historically in fundraising. We can talk about that. But we never struggled in convincing people this was a big market. That was sort of a given. There is uh, $700 billion a year spent on local services just in the United States. Uh, there's somewhere on the order of 20 to 30 million Americans who make their entire living by providing their skills, their trades, their time to consumers. Uh, it's a gigantic market. And the shocking thing about it, if you think about it, is that there's no company with really any significant market cap that has, that has been serving this market. You know, Yelp, Angie's List, all these companies are pretty small, even Thumbtack, right? With a billion dollars a year, that's just over 10 bips or 0.1% of market share. 
So it is day one for us and the entire industry. And I think of it sort of as e-commerce in 1995 or 1996. I think in three, four, five years, people will look back and say, how the hell did I ever hire a plumber without Thumbtack? I don't even remember because the alternative seems so inconceivable. So that's sort of the dream that we're chasing and what we're fighting for. Awesome, thanks. All right, so let's go way back and uh, to get to the theme of the talk. Um, you know, if, if, if you had a merit badge for every time you were turned down, you know, you'd be like the most decorated Boy Scout up here on the stage by I'd have far. 42 of them, but, yeah. who, but who's counting, right? So, like, so what happened? You know, it, it's, obviously it's really difficult to get an early stage company uh, funded, but now that you're way on the other side of that, you almost seem like proud of it. It's definitely made you stronger. What, what happened along the way? And, and let's, well, time let's heals all wounds. <laughs> uh, so I definitely I take some pride in it now. So uh, what Brian is alluding to is the fact that we really struggled to raise our Series A. Um, you know, we raised an angel round in June of 2010, and we raised it from great angels, uh, Jason Kalkanis, uh, Scott and Sam Bannister, lots of great people. And the advice that we got, by and large, was to solve the chicken and the egg problem. You know, marketplaces have that sort of activation challenge of how do you get going when you have neither side. And so we were laser focused on that. And Honestly, a year later, in the summer of 2011, we felt pretty fucking good about it. We had really like solved that problem. We had real traction. It was growing. And so sort of chest kind of puffed out, we went and tried to raise our Series A in the fall of 2011, asking for, I think it was $10 million at first. The reaction from basically all venture capitalists, which uh, not to sort of uh, disparage them, but you don't often get the same answer. You often get a scattered array of no's but they very uh, surprisingly focused on our lack of monetization. People said, congratulations on figuring out how to attract customers and professionals, but how the hell are you gonna make money? You know, we had a story, but clearly that story did not stick. And so we had to talk to a lot of people until we realized, you know what? We just need to go prove to them that we can make money. And so about halfway through our process, we threw up what was at the time, and even in retrospect, an imperfect monetization scheme. We put up a subscription model, which I just, just described to you as a thing pros don't want, but we did it to show that we could make money from our engaged network of professionals. And that helped us sort of convince a couple of investors, and you know, Javelin really gets credit for seeing us as a team capable of solving this problem uh, before really anybody else. And that was the spark that led to where we are today. And uh, two lessons uh, from that, which served us very well in future fundraisings. The first was, know what the next round wants. We made the mistake of optimizing on what the previous round said to focus on. But really, every round is a bridge round, right? You're trying to get somewhere, and you need to understand what the people on the other end are interested in seeing to get past that gate. And we should have talked to more Series A investors and understood that the Series A at this point is your first growth round. You need to have sort of unit economics that tell a good story and sort of a growth strategy to sort of scale that up. We didn't do that, though in the future we got better about it. The other thing is raise when you can, not when you need it. So uh, we had picked very arbitrarily the fall of 2011 as the time to go raise money. Um, despite the fact that in the sort of first half of 2011, it was one of those golden periods where I don't know if we could have done it, but I think we actually could have gone out and raised um, the original Series A that we had wanted to. Um, but we said, you know what? We're not going to time the market. We're going to do it when we thought we should do it. And that was a big mistake because the world changed a lot in those couple of months. So we've been much more opportunistic since then, and I think that has served our business very well. Awesome. Um, you, you mentioned something in the beginning of that answer about just the investor feedback. And um, as an investor, I'm always really conscious about the feedback that I provide to, to companies because I want to explain you know, my views on the business if, if the company wants to hear it. But at the same time, I don't want them to oversample me and to make changes based on the feedback that I provide because I, we, maybe we spend an hour together. Can you talk a little bit about how, how you've processed investor feedback along mm -hmm. the way in these rounds? Because it does sound like you went and focused on the business model after that round of no's, but otherwise, how have you processed the VCs? Yeah. So uh, the advice I give is don't really listen to what they say because they're just trying to get you out of the room at a certain point. And even if you, like, poop, sorry, Brian. No, I was, <laughs> that's why I take the question up. I mean, it, 
And so even <laughs> if you think you have a retort to that concern, the reality is they're just not at a yes. So there's really only two answers, yes and not yes. The specific no doesn't matter at all. But in aggregate, if you start hearing the same thing from three, four, five people, that, I think, is real signal. And the truth is, these folks see many more companies and have more perspective than we do about sort of business evolution, right? This is our first startup. Uh, we have a sample of one. And so in aggregate, I think if those people who have a big sample are giving you consistent feedback, there's some truth in that that you should address and think real hard about. Cool. One more financing question, then we'll move on. Is there any advice that you, I mean, obviously the world's changed a lot over the last couple months, and you've been through a couple cycles in a, uh, now with, 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 with your company as a founder of Thumbtack. Do you have any advice for anyone in the crowd who might be raising money in the next quarter or two and how they should think about that process? Yeah, so I think it depends a lot on what you're optimizing for. Um, and I think you will see that the people who are struggling the most are the ones who are most fixated on the short term on that valuation having a certain number of digits, on the round being from certain people in certain ways. Um, and I think this people who will be more successful are the ones who are playing the long game. Um, and the reality is the fundraising climate is like the weather. We all have to deal with it. It's the same for everybody. Don't feel picked on. Don't feel like you are a special flower that is being sort of you know, messed with. Just deal with it. Dress appropriately and get it done and move on to the much more important things, um, which is delighting your customers and building an organization that can really fulfill your mission. So um, it's a necessary step, and I think it's one that I think can be dismissed as sort of um, orthogonal, but really it's a very clarifying moment. that forces you to think hard about your business, what's working, what's not, how to tell that story, and don't shy away from that promise or that, that sort of activity. But but also be honest with yourself. And don't lie to yourself so long that it kills your business. Uh, I think that's a very sad and, and um, unfortunate thing that happens. Makes sense. Um, what, are, what are your top you know, two or three lessons learned as a founder building a company that oh. you'd like to share, particularly with this audience and with this theme? Um, so I think one thing that I would not have guessed, so it's a surprise rather than a lesson, is how emotional the journey is. So it's easy to presume that it's going to be hard work. It's easy to presume it may take a long time. I think what I certainly didn't appreciate was how emotional it would be. And I think where it comes from upon reflecting on it is humans are in the business of extrapolating. right? You're always sort of projecting forward. And at a startup, you have so few data points that every new data point can radically alter that projection. It can be pointed at the moon and you feel invincible, and then you learn one little thing and it's pointed into the ground and you feel like there's no hope. Um, and that is nauseating. It's a really unpleasant feeling. Um, we joke it's like the emo Roco that we're all on. So I would uh, know that you are not alone in feeling that. Know that you are uh, not uh, in any way sort of different or worse off for that, but it's just part of the game, and it's something that you have to sort of learn to manage, particularly in a team setting. I think it's hard personally, but then it's even harder when you think about the fact that all these people are feeling it, and you're trying to keep people motivated and excited about what we're doing. So, you know, uh, embrace the emotionality of it, I guess. Hmm. That's awesome. Um, let's talk about being a CEO. Uh, you, didn't, you don't have an MBA. You know, you, you don't have a ton of corporate experience which is actually something we look for. We look for people without corporate experience, funny enough. Um, how, how, you know, what have you learned along the way about growing from being a founder into the CEO of what is now a fairly large company? So I have the benefit of not knowing anything, and that's how I start most uh, sort of uh, efforts to, to figure out what to do. I think th the biggest lesson has been how much I need to grow and change, and through that, how much of this whole effort is about self-awareness, right? Understanding what you're good at, what you're bad at, what your strengths are, how you're perceived, how you're able to motivate or not people in different circumstances. And I think if you think about what leadership is, it's helping get people to sort of rally around a shared vision and be intrinsically motivated to go solve it. And to inspire that, you first and foremost have to know about yourself 
And there's no one type of leader. Having met a lot of great leaders, they're all, you know, some are at the front of the stage, you know, jumping up and down, some are in the back of the room and everywhere in between. And I think you just need to figure out who you are to find your voice. Um, and that's a very humbling uh, process because most of the things you find out about yourself were things that you were hiding from, right? Things that you like didn't want to admit you're not very good at or you didn't want to sort of come to terms with the fact that you're perceived in a certain way. Um, so that's part of the grind. Cool. <clears throat> and um, let's talk about building the team. What do you, maybe I'm gonna split this into, into two parts. What type of people were you looking to add to the team when it was just the founding core for your first few hires, your first few non-founder hires? And then contrast that to the types of folks you've added to your team over the last year. So I actually think the startup community does a bit of a disservice to early stage entrepreneurs, particularly super early stage entrepreneurs, um, by telling them all these things about culture fit. Culture fit is a luxury that you hope to be in a position to hire for. But the reality is, the first guy we hired, we met on a rafting trip, and he just fell in love with the idea. And he wouldn't go away. <laughs> he, he, he worked for free, he would just show up after work, and the dude just loved the idea. You know, were we optimizing for culture fit? No, we were optimizing for somebody who was gonna accept a tiny salary, a lot of paper equity that was worth zero on a good day. I would have uh, taken that. Yeah, but, but like, <laughs> it's, it's all about self-selection. And so I think the way to do it early on is to sort of chase like your passions and push, put yourself in a position where you can meet similarly passionate people. Um, because that's ultimately what you're aligning on. And it's really hard to be too selective because you, you truthfully don't have that many options. Nobody cares about you. Um, now, fast forward you know, five, six years later, now we can be much more deliberate and uh, explicit about who we hire. And we think about it in sort of two dimensions. It's the technical skill, I don't mean that simply sort of the engineering skill, but the, the technical skills you need to be good at your trade be it as a comms person, a marketer, an engineer, a designer, what do we have to find in you that will make you successful? And I think startups uh, make the mistake of looking for um, a laundry list of things. And you should really focus on just two or three and find somebody who is just amazing at that and live with the rest. So that's the first dimension, the sort of technical skill. And then it's the culture fit. And culture fit is not somebody that you want to get beers with. You are not hiring your friends. Uh, you're hiring somebody who shares your values, such that when you are making a decision, even if you're independent of each other, you're gonna approach it in a similar way with a similar set of priors. That's what helps align the sort of uh, decision-making of the company and makes it very easy to sort of debate things and find solutions even in a sort of contentious, stressful place. So um, it really changes. So at first, focus on uh, find the people who are just motivated and passionate about the same things you are. Later on, focus on sort of the technical skills and the values fit to build a sort of effective organization. Okay. So as you, as you look forward to the rest of, of this year, um, what, what do you see for Thumbtack? You know, what's, what's, what are we going to see coming out of the company in the next 12 to 18 months? How are, you, how are you managing the business in the grand scheme of kind of big changes from a macroeconomics perspective? So I'll speak first to what the sort of ambition is. Uh, very simply, we want to turn Thumbtack into a verb, right? When somebody asks Brian, hey, you know a good plumber, I want the answer to be, hey, man, just Thumbtack it. They'll find you the right guy. That, to me, is success. Like, that is the ambition that we are chasing. Um, and the way that that happens is if we become sort of as reliable as Google or Amazon, that we can just deliver each and every time. Um, so the focus this year is really around consistency and reliability. We know that the model works. We know that our customers love it. We know that our professionals love it. The challenge is we cover a 1,000 different categories in every city in the United States. So being able to find you the right person each and every time is just super fucking hard. And uh, we are not good enough at it yet. Uh, and so we are just going to keep grinding on that till we get it right. Awesome. 
sounds like the way to end it. I want to thank uh, Startup Grind for having us. Thank you for coming, Marco. Thanks, Brian. And most of all, thanks for being a, a company that we're so happy to be involved with from a Sequoia perspective. <laughs> thanks, man.